So after that uh, brief interruption, uh, I'm happy to be here calling from California. My colleagues, uh, Robert, Daniel, and Sebastian are in Germany. And uh, we're going to present a talk, N Ways to Fool the Masses, or yourself when presenting parallel and time results. And the N is basically because uh, I didn't know when I submitted the abstract how many we'd get to. But um, in 1991, many of you might know this paper. David Bailey wrote a paper, 12 Ways to Fool the Masses When Giving Performance Results on Parallel Computers. And I think it's reasonably uh, well-known paper. Go ahead, Robert. And these are the original 12 ways. I'm not going to read through them all, but I do want to point out the bottom one. Um, if all else fails, show pretty pictures and animated videos and don't talk about performance. So go ahead and switch. Um, this idea caught on. Almost immediately, there was a response from Gustafson about vector computers, and then you can read these. Uh, the 14 ways to say nothing with scientific visualization was a direct response to number 12 in the original paper. And then if you read down, you get GPUs, and now people have been doing this with machine learning and um, deep learning. So are these for real? If you read the original paper, there's no specific um, you know, numerical results, and they're, they're kind of funny, but they're undoubtedly funnier to some people than others because some of them, I think, are meant to be embarrassing. Um, there are no, also no citations in the original paper, so they're not calling people out. They're just expecting that if you know the field, you'll be able to recognize what's going on. So what we're going to do today is we're going to present uh, N equals five examples, and we're writing a paper where hopefully we'll get to 12. Um, but unlike the original paper, we're actually going to run examples. And in fact, all the examples are done with the libfast code. So um, of the five today, they're all either fast or pair real. And LibFast can do both fast and pair real. So um, we plan to make these examples available on the LibFast uh, GitHub repo. So you can just download them and run them yourself and fool yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna start. And my first way to fool yourself is to run a problem that secretly tends to a steady state. And for this, I've picked a fancy looking nonlinear advection diffusion reaction equation, which I've, I've listed here. I'm not going to tell you what A and nu and beta are. That would be cheating. And so if you want really good speed up for pair real, you got to have a lot of processors. So I'm using 128 processors. And it helps to have a lot of fine steps versus coarse steps for good speed up. So I'm taking 128 fine steps per processor. So that means I can take a really long time interval. I'm doing time equals 20 here. So we'll see how parallel works. Um, I'm only going to compute the theoretical speed up. Why bother actually timing the code? Okay, Robert, go ahead. So here I'm plotting the total number of iterations to converge for parallel. These are my 128 processors. And you see that the first one only takes one iteration, the second one takes two, and then all the rest of them take three, which is the optimal parallel convergence. Um, I got three because, of course, I chose my tolerance to be exactly the uh, minimum needed to get three iterations. And then if I choose my, or if I do the model of what the speed up should be and I plug in the numbers, I see, oh, I should get about 32 times speed up. So that's pretty good for this complicated nonlinear reaction diffusion equation. Okay, Robert. So then you ask, well, what does this thing actually do? So the initial condition is a Gaussian, and I'm plotting on the left the solution in real space, and in the right the Fourier transform. So you see it's got some spectral components out to about wave number 10 or something. OK, go ahead. So after time one, you can see the Berger's terms makes this sharpen, and we're getting actually a lot of action in spectral space. Go on. I have 2.5. You wouldn't believe it. My home internet literally went down. I'm calling on my phone now. Well, I see what uh, Well, I think I was done, right? So basically what I was showing was that one quarter of the way through the simulation, you've reached basically steady state and then the rest of the simulation, nothing happens. So this is a, a, a very common problem if you have a problem with diffusion in it and you're not careful in looking at the solution, you realize that basically you're computing something which is a constant. Okay. Sorry about the uh, internet mix up. All right, so then I, I will continue with number two, which is um, use a stopping criterion that is unrelated to the accuracy of your fine solver and 
kind of like a subset of this is uh, use the ODE error instead of the PDE error. So you can either use the stopping criterion that's totally unrelated, or as I'm going to do, I'm going to use one that is only related to the, to the error of the time discretization, but doesn't really care about the space discretization. So what I want to solve is advection diffusion, linear, reasonably simple, um, with, the, with the velocity of 0 0.9, and the diffusivity parameter of um, one over a thousand. Well, it's not terribly diffusive, so I'm, I'm not making my life too easy. Yeah, so this, this is quite vector dominated. Um, I'm using fast, so in contrast to what Michael showed, I'm not using Pagareal, this is using fast. And since this is high order in time, um, I'm using a spectral method in space. I'm going to simulate this until a final time of 3.2 using 80 time steps. And I also use a Gaussian as initial data. So I have energy in all the modes. And I'm going to use five SDC nodes and 256 free modes on the fine level. And I'm coarsening this for the coarse level to three SDC nodes and 128 modes on the coarse level. All of this looks fairly reasonable. And first I need to compute, if I want to figure out speed up, I have to compute a serial reference, a baseline. And I do this by giving my SDC method so one of the advantage of STC is because it's iterative, I can give it a tolerance and just say, iterate until you manage to match the tolerance. So I give it a tolerance of 10 to the minus nine. And basically the tolerance to STC tells you how well you are approximating your collocation solution. So it's, it's, it's basically a tolerance for the ODE error, for the dis time discretization. And then I'm very happy to see my STC manages to uh, reach this tolerance in eight iterations in all the time steps. The actual residual at the end is three times 10 to the minus 10. So it is about the order that I set. And the whole simulation takes about 100 milliseconds to run. So I ran this on the computer in my office. Um, so this is, this is all good and well, and I'm, I'm happy. Um, Robert, can you go ahead? Thank you. So in order to figure out my speed up, I run fast and I, I don't want to cheat. I give it the same residual. So I, I try to balance the accuracy of the fine serial integrator and the fast method. So I also give fast a tolerance of 10 to the minus nine. Um, I use eight processors because this is how many I have in my computer. And then the good news is that fast also converges in eight iterations. So I, I don't have a penalty in terms of additional iterations for the, for the parallelization. And it only takes about 50 milliseconds to run again on my office computer. So that's pretty good. So I can say my speed up on eight cores is well 100 milliseconds divided by 50 milliseconds. So I got a speed up of two and I get this using eight cores. So my parallel efficiency is 25%, which is pretty decent. So this is maybe not, not groundbreaking, but this is a pretty decent speed up. So if I get something like this with fast, I'm generally quite happy. Uh, so this is why you can see the happy face there. So what's the catch now? The catch is, well, if, if I actually look at the error of the fine serial baseline propagator, which in this case I can do because the problem is actually so simple that I, I mean, I, I know how the solution looks like to the advection diffusion equation. The actual error is actually pretty high. So it's about six times 10 to the minus one. So what this means is that most of the work that my fine serial method is doing is completely unnecessary. Yeah, although I get a very nice, very low residual, this, this doesn't really in any way bring me closer to the solution of the PDE that I actually want to compute. So then if I instead actually set the tolerance to something that is more balanced with the actual PDE error. So I set the tolerance to one over 10 instead of 10 to the minus nine. The final error for the serial fine method actually goes down. And the reason is that because of all the additional iterations I'm doing, I'm accu ac accumulating more round of error. So by reducing the tolerance for my fine propagate, I get a more accurate solution. So the, the, the error is about half. And the runtime drops by a factor of three. So I'm now suddenly just, it just, need 30 milliseconds. So just, just by using a residual for my serial baseline method um, that is more in line with the actual error, I get about a factor of three speed up. Um, and now of course the problem is that if I rerun fast with the same tolerance, 
Um, the error is comparable. It's, it's slightly bigger because, again, fast there's a lot of extra computation. So there's probably a bit more accumulation of round of error. But it's, it's comparable. But unfortunately, now the runtime is around 30 milliseconds as well. So suddenly all the nice gain I had, all the speed up from my parallelization is lost. So now I'm unhappy. And um, so basically all, all the speed up I saw in the beginning was because I managed to parallelize a lot of work that I actually don't need. Yeah. So triple unhappy face. So this is, this is just one example where how, if, if you just look at the ODE error or don't look at errors at all, you can easily run into a setup where, where, where basically most of the speed up comes from doing extra additional work that you don't need. The problem is of course, in the real applications, you may have a hard time figuring out what the actual error is. So it may not be as easy as it is here to spot when you're actually fooling yourself that way. All right. That is me. I'm going to pick up where uh, Danny left because now we're actually going to look at the PDE error. So number three is uh, over-resolve in space. Um, and we're going to be take the simplest thing you can think of. That is 1D heat equation on the unit interval, nothing very spectacular going on. It's periodic in space. But hey, we're taking sine uh, 8 pi x as the initial condition. So it's, it, it, it's simple, but not the simplest thing you can think. Anyway, so we're going to use STC and FAST again. And uh, well, we go, we, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pretending to do a very decent job. I'm using fourth order in time with STC. So it's going to be three gauss lobato nodes. And I'm going to use fourth order in space for finer differences. So that's the standard uh, criticism by reviewers that you lose a high order in time and low order in space. No, we're not going to do that. And dx and dt are actually balanced so that the PDE error is about 10 to minus 7. So that's honest, I think. We're going to do coarsening in space only by a factor of two in the following, and we'll compare this to the theoretical speed up only. We'll come to that later. Okay, so let, let's see. Well, it's heat equation, so you'd expect that things work pretty well. So uh, you see on the, uh, on, on the plot here that at, if I take up to 16 parallel steps, I get a speed of five with the number of grid points 128, which is exactly the balanced, uh, achieves the uh, balanced error. Oh, it's good. Okay, so that does work even with coarsening. Perfect. But I, I, I hear that people use spectral methods and now I'm going to say, well, obviously this will work with spectral methods. Well, so let's, let's try. And yay, it does exactly the same. I get five times speed up with 16 parallel steps. If I take just spectral method here and it's, it's high order, it's, it's awesome, right? Well, the thing here is that I, I, I take the same number of grid points and obviously find a difference for the spectral methods, that's not fair. So I wouldn't need 128 uh, grid points for spectral methods as this is heavily over-resolving in space just because I know that it's going to work with parallel time. So what do I need to get this error down to what I want in the PDE sense? Well, I need exactly eight grid points, which just comes from the fact that I have a sine eight pi x. But then my speed up is completely crap. I just, I barely get to a factor of two when I take 16 time steps. So the, the question is why? And of course, if I course now the problem from going from uh, uh, eight grid points to four, the cost level doesn't see anything. It's, it's virtually doing nothing which is of any use. So this is at the end pipelining STC I'm doing here. And this doesn't help whatsoever. So what I have to do in order to make fast or parallel time whatsoever work is I have to increase the uh, resolution in space again, even beyond my PDE error to make it work. So I just take now in this case, 16 degrees of uh, no, grid points and then I'm back to my factor of five, but I have to run my parallel time code at a resolution where I wouldn't run it sequentially in, uh, in time. So that is actually what you would do with over resolve which is how you fool yourself if you just take a too many degrees of freedom just to make your cost level work. Okay, there you go, Sebastian. All right, so let's move to the thing with the theoretical speed up, right? So if you heard me give a talk in one of the recent Pine meetings, this example comes with no surprise to you. I'm going to talk about optimal control. And it's the, let's call it hello world example, the very simplest for time dependent control. What we want to do is we have the heat equation and we try to find some control. I called it C to 
drive the solution to some desired state. I don't go into detail. What you have to do to solve that is given some control, you have to solve the heat equation and you have to solve a second set of equations, the adjoint equations. And for simplicity, let's just use homogeneous initial conditions and let's solve that fast. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> So we do 20 time steps. We choose three levels, three, two, two, three, five Lovato nodes, some degrees of freedom in space for uh, discretizing spectrally. We use MLSTC as a sequential baseline uh, coming from optimal control. If you don't know anything about your control, you start with zero control and then you iterate until you solve the solution. But then uh, Michael comes ahead and tells me, yeah, you know what happens if you have the heat equation with zero right-hand side and zero initial conditions, it's just an expensive way to compute zeros. So let's do something else there. And then we learned uh, from Daniel that probably the residual 10 to minus 10 is not what we need. All right, so let's look what happens. Let's count iterations to get the speed up. We count the serial iterations for state and adjoint. We count the total iterations for the state on the last CPU and the total iterations for the adjoint on the first because that's backward in time. And we get a decent speed of around seven. That's good, that's 35% parallel efficiency. That's nice, let's publish that. But well, let's look at actual timings. So serial wall clock time divided by parallel wall clock time, and we get a speed up of 2.4. So that's only about a third of the predicted one. Why is that? Well, first we do optimization. So we evaluate objective functions. We count compute gradients. But if we look at solving only the state equation, so just the plain heat equation forward in time, nothing special, it looks a bit better, but not that much. Right? And then if we think about it, all the optimization overhead is more or less trivially parallel in time. So that cannot be the reason. But the reason is the thing that we all expect to be free in some sense, uh, which is communication or to be more precise, the serial part. So if we look at the right uh, picture here, that's timings for the uh, actual STC iterations on the cores, the middle and the fine level. And that's the MPI sense and receive. And what we see is that somewhat surprisingly, the course level receives are the most expensive part in the whole thing. And this is different from what Robert told in the last talk, because that's really the serial course level communication that's blocking MPI communication and there is wait times involved. So, um, what's the key takeaway here? Well, sometimes it just might not be enough to count iterations to get a meaningful evaluation of your actual parallel and time performance. And maybe second, that communication is not that inexpensive as we all tend to hope. Michael, okay. are you here? Yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, okay, so the last of the five uh, ways today is, uh, as many of you know, my favorite. It's to ignore the fact that higher order methods exist because, hey, if it's good enough for Euler, shouldn't it be good enough for me? Um, so I'm going to explain this again with Parareal. I'm looking at a 2D linear advection, uh, diffusion equation here. And this time I'm not going to run to t equals 20 so that I'm not computing a steady state. I'll use a spectral method in time, or in space, sorry, so that only time errors are important. And I choose again a Gaussian initial condition so I don't fool myself with only having one Fourier mode. And I'm gonna use my first order exponential Runge cutter time integrator, which is something kind of new and fast, so I'm just sort of showing it off there. I, I treat the diffusive term exponentially and the advective term um, non-linearly, even though it's linear in this case. So in order to get about eight digits of accuracy, I need 4,096 total time steps. So I'm gonna use 64 time steps on the fine level in parareal and one on the course level. So uh, 64 squared is 4,096. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, I run this on the nurse supercomputer named Corey. Uh, the one, the serial code takes about 10 seconds and then four nodes is about half that. So for 16 uh, parallel and time processors, I get about a speed up of five. Go ahead. And I say, that's success. I should publish that, right? Well, maybe not. So let me try and repeat this experiment using the fourth order exponential Runge-Kutta method, which is in LibFast. And in order to do this, I have to change one number in the input file from one to four. So it's not a whole lot of extra work. And then I ask, how many time steps do I need for the same accuracy as I got with my first order method? So I try 1,024 first, and I see that, oh, that's machine precision. And I work my way down, and I, I try and try. And I realize I need six time steps. And if you remember, the runtime for the serial method was 10. And the best I got for the parallel method was um, uh, about 1.8. So my, go ahead, flip the slide. So my serial fourth order code gives as accurate an answer as my first order code with 16 processors, but it's 18 times faster. And I can play this game over and over. I, if, I, if I change the number of time steps on the first order method, I can also change the number of time steps on the fourth order method. And this is particularly painful if you're a fan of fast because a lot of our integrators that we like to use are eighth order accurate or 15th order accurate. And you can't just parallelize six time steps. So if you're trying to compare parallel and time speed ups by methods with different orders in time, it can be difficult and you can fool yourself. Okay, so the conclusion part, uh, part so this is not being funny anymore, it's supposed to be serious, is that designing meaningful parallel and time cases is actually not always trivial. And a lot of times we just try something and we see speed up and we publish it without thinking too much about why we're getting the, the speed up. But a lot of these conversations that we've had bet uh, between the four of us has come because we're trying to compare two different methods. And it becomes even harder to try and figure out something which is not unfair to one method or you know, really, really brings out the difference between the parallel and time methods. And it gets even worse if you start thinking about trying to make a benchmark case that everybody in the parallel and time community can run their code on. And we've been talking about this at these meetings now, I think at least for five years, and we've made very little progress. Okay, so the last slide, I think is just uh, acknowledgements. I want to thank everyone for uh, coming and listening, and I need to thank my sponsors in the DOE Office of Science for support. So thank you very much. <laughs>